to what? What? Did you say Utes? Yeah, two Utes. What is a Ute? <laughs> when Colorado represented the Pac-12 South in this past season's conference championship game, it meant that the Utah Utes are now the only team from the South Division to have never played in the conference championship game. Even though the program has won a total of 28 games in the past three seasons, it just have never been able to really get over that hump in recent times. But Kyle Whittingham is willing to change that. You see, Coach Whittingham is now hiring a new offensive coordinator. I know, what's new, right? I mean, you thought Texas went through quite a few coordinators recently. Well, Utah has gone through even more in just the nine-year stretch. This is the eighth new coordinator at the Utah program, Troy Taylor. Now, Troy Taylor, two years ago at this time, was coaching high school football, and last year, he was at Eastern Washington. So as far as FBS football, major college football, this is going to be a new experience for him. And he's going to bring an offense that's very quarterback friendly and will really emphasize the passing game. They won't completely forget about the running game. But if you've watched Utah football in the past, you know it kind of reminds you of those 1980s Washington Redskins teams, you know, the ones that have the hogs up front and the diesel John Riggins running behind them, a very physical, in-your-type face football. Now it's going to be the majority of passing. You're going to see the receivers spread out. And again, a very friendly quarterback type offense. And that should really help Troy Williams if he is still the starter. He's the incumbent. And he started 2016 with a bang. You might remember that win against USC in the second half. Three straight touchdown drives. Okay, So we know the guy can play. But as the season progressed, his completion percentage declined. So... I don't think his starting position is 100% secure. In fact, Tyler Huntley could very well be the guy at quarterback, even though I know he's played seven weight, the sophomore, who's pretty athletic, and he's in for the running, as is former Alabama quarterback Cooper Bateman. Running game, boy, he was a stud. Joe Williams, remember early last year, came out of retirement because Utah was seriously banged up in the backfield, and Williams really caught fire, gaining about 1,400 yards on the ground, but now you lose him. He's in the NFL. Zach Moss and Armand Shine will probably get a good share of the workload in that backfield, but both have to stay away from those injuries, which nagged them last year. Moss had 382 net rushing yards, and not far behind, Shine had 373 net yards on the ground. But a guy that could really break through as far as being that number one guy if Utah does not go running back by committee would be Devontae Henry Cole, who last year hardly touched the ball as a freshman. But during the spring, looked very impressive, especially in the spring game. Receivers, a big pickup for Oregon if he can keep his act together. Talking about Darren Carrington, who on the field, hey, I'm not going to question him. Five touchdowns a year ago. Very productive for the Ducks, including over 600 yards in receiving. And two years ago was second team all Pac-12. But if you know anything about the Pac-12 and Oregon, you know that Carrington was an absolute mess off the field, including a DUI not too long ago. And that was the final straw for Oregon. They kicked him off the team. And Utah is hoping that those off-the-field issues are a thing of the passion. You might remember you know, it's like the reversal of that saying. If you can beat them, join them. And Utah fans know what I'm talking about. That heartbreak loss in 2016 in which Carrington caught the game-winning touchdown in Salt Lake City to upset the Utes. But now he's no longer the enemy. He's an ally. Raylan Singleton hopes to make a contribution. Red Surf Jr. Um, last season, four touchdowns. And he had 27 receptions. And Damare... Uh, Simpkins, a sophomore, last year as a freshman, started in five games. They are J.J. Dealman, Sam Tevy, as well as Isaac Asieta and Garrett Bowles. Those four guys started on the offensive line last season for Utah. All four of those guys I just mentioned, they were selected in this past spring's NFL draft, including Bowles, who was a uh, first-round selection by the Denver Broncos. Left a year early, and I guess you can kind of see why. You talk about the rebuilding and rebuilding jobs in Salt Lake City. That's what Whittingham and his staff faced entering 2017 because you only returned one full-time starter amongst the starting five, and that is Celesi Uatapi, who has played in all 39 games in his career and has started 25 of them. So right tackle, shouldn't have anything to worry about. But the other four positions, hardly any 
playing experience at all up front. In fact, the right guard, the sophomore, Johnny Capra, appeared in only one game last year. At center, a senior in low Falemaka appeared in 10 games in 2016, but only played two of them on the offensive line. Left side of the line, the tackle, tallest player on the squad, 6'7", that's Jackson Barton, made six appearances in 2016. And running out the starting five for Utah, left guard, a sophomore in Darren Paolo, mainly a special teams player in 2016. There is, though, some starting experience at the tight end spot. CLA, Fakali, Loa Tonga, he's been there a while. In fact, um, you know, year number one, um, got a start. The following year, two starts. And in 2015, his most productive year, five starts. But last season, didn't see him at all because of injury. So that's the Utah offensive side. And again, they will throw more than what we've seen in seasons past. There are three areas that I'm going to emphasize for the Utah defense. Number one, scoring. They only gave up 24 points per game. Area number two. When the opposition tried to run the ball against Utah, generally the opposition wasn't successful. Utah only gave up 125 rushing yards per game. The good news for the Utes is that both of the defensive tackles are back, including Lowell Latulier now entering his senior year, a three-time All-Pac-12 player. The senior, though, really needs to watch for that shoulder. The shoulder difficulty um, made him uh, sit out for the spring game. Of course, he is the uh, younger brother of star Latulier, who of course, was an absolute star for the Utes during his heyday, All-American there, now making the big bucks for the Carolina Panthers. The other tackle can play, too, in Filippo Mocafisi, a senior who had five sacks. Topic number three ties into my next area, sacks. You can easily call Salt Lake City Sack Lake City because that's what they exemplified, sacks. No other Pac-12 school last year had more sacks than those guys, 43 sacks. That's the good news. Not so good news is that most of that sack production has now moved on, including both defensive ends. We're talking about uh, one of them in Hunter Dimmick, who had 14 and a half of those 43 sacks, over a third of them coming from one player. So we'll see how the new crop of defensive ends do as far as starters for the Utes, and that includes Kylie Fitz, who can really create fits against the opposition if he's healthy. The now senior had his 2016 season wrecked because of injury, but the year before did lead the Pac-12 with four forced fumbles. The other uh, defensive end is uh, Bradley uh, Anai, whom as a freshman played in six games. Both linebackers return, and Utah will generally play a 4-2-5 defense, so these guys are going to see a lot of playing time and should be very effective. The middle linebacker in Sunia Talatioli, is back, and um, Sunia, I remember in the Holy War against BYU, ran back an interception for a touchdown off the first play from scrimmage in that Utah win, and in the victory against USC, uh, Sunia had 11 tackles. The other linebacker on the outside is going to be Kavika Tuafatasonga, who had eight starts a year ago and could either play the stud linebacker position or he could play the rover, had 52 stops a year ago. Pretty good. Secondary, though, is going to be a big area of emphasis for the Utes because they lost most of that production. Both corners are gone. Brian Allen, an NFL draft pick, and Reggie Porter trying to make it with the Baltimore Ravens. So you got to replace both corners. Tyrone Smith entering his junior year um, was mostly used as a receiver in 2016, was not converted to defense until late in the year. So I guess better late than never. And then the other corner who will also be returning kicks is Julian Blackman who did not see a lot of action in his um, freshman year, now a sophomore. As far as the safeties, some good and bad. The bad first, uh, you lose um, a very productive safety in Marcus Williams, second-round draft pick from the New Orleans Saints. But you do get Chase Hansen um, back 90 tackles a year ago that led the team in that department. Uh, a free safety that hopes that he can make an impact from Blinn Junior College and Corian Ballard. In terms of special teams, Utah has owned the Ray Guy Award for each of the past three seasons, and Mitch Wisnowski is back. Of course, the reigning Ray Guy Award winner, 48 yards per punt is his average, and he had a plethora of punts a year ago that exceeded 50 yards. Yeah, the high elevation helps, but you also have to be a pretty good punter, and that's exactly what Wisnowski is. And the place kicker in Hayes Hicken, who last year we saw full-time 
as the kickoff specialist. He'll continue to do that, but now he steps into some big shoes, replacing an all-conference Pac-12 kicker. Highlighting the schedule for the Utes, the second game of the year. Should be fun. It usually is when the Utes and Cougars get together. It's the Holy War. Last year, Utah edged out BYU by one point, but this year's game is at Provo. If you can't win the conference opener at Arizona, then your chances of getting to a bowl game get greatly compromised. That's because the schedule will only get tougher, and that means you also have to play USC. you got to play them on the road this time, even though I know Utah holds the distinction of being the last team to have defeated USC. The Trojans will be fully loaded and expected to win the South. Again, they got to play them at the Coliseum. The other unfortunate thing about the Utah schedule, they got to play the top four teams from the opposite division, the North. That means showdowns against Stanford, which they get at home in early October, but they got to go to reigning Pac-12 champion Washington in the latter part of November. The Vegas win total for Utah, 6.5. I'm going to say seven wins. Seven is as far as I'll go. I think rush defense-wise, they'll still be good, but they won't be as good as far as getting to the quarterback because of those losses on that side of the ball. And I think that will really take its toll on the secondary, who already is inexperienced. Offensively, I just don't know how they'll do at quarterback. And, of course, the offensive line faces the biggest challenge of all, losing four of their five down linemen. It will be a little bit of a declining year for Utah at seven wins, but that's probably to be expected considering the amount of talent that they lost. That's my look at Utah. We'll see you next time.